I'm pleased to introduce Katie Bainbridge with us today. Katie is the president of the Lion Assess and Achieve, and she has written the book series, The Common Core, Clarifying Expectations for Teachers and Students. So now I will go ahead and turn it over to Katie. Hello, all, and thank you so much uh, for having me. Just a little bit about uh, uh, Align Assess Achieve. We are um, in about 200 school districts a year. We work with teachers on uh, standards-based instruction, all kinds of um, instructional strategies. Um, our area of expertise is really around assessment and, and alignment, um, using that information to guide your instruction. Um, we are honored to be partners with McGraw-Hill, and um, they uh, distribute our products for us. So it's been a wonderful partnership um, since 2011. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I actually am out. Uh, just want to let you know where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in Columbus, Ohio, um, uh, and it is a, a, a lovely day here today. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of start um, broader and then drill deeper into the content. Um, really start with that in, uh, effective instructional strategies um, in a broader sense of what it really looks like in the classroom, sort of painting a a picture of standards-based instruction, and then drill down a little bit deeper into the assessment design and what are the qualities that really make a valid and reliable assessment. And then we'll get into some fun uh, topics of grading practices and how do we accurately report that out um, for our families. So, so kind of starting at that broader level and then drilling a little bit down. Painting the picture for good instruction, this is really um, starting with that align key. Um, what, what we have done over the course of um, probably 10 years with researchers and our, our trainers that are out in the classrooms, we've landed on sort of three keys to quality instruction, three keys for, um, for a framework that happens in every pre-K through 12 classroom. Um, so I'll, start, I'll paint that picture for you just to kind of see, um, see our, our philosophy, and then, and then we'll kind of dig deep into that. The first key is the key of a, and this is really knowing where you're headed with your students. This is putting your activities and your resources on a shelf and really um, asking ourselves, what do we want our students to learn? What is the deeper understanding here? What's the big idea? And then what, is, what are those learning targets underneath this? This is really about putting our activities, putting our resources on a shelf for a minute and saying, what is our road map for learning? And really leading with with learning. And then everything falls into place after that. After we have that roadmap for learning, that deeper understanding and those learning targets, then we can start to assess, then we can use that information. Um, so really looking at that alignment key, and we always say it's really like two different levels. It's, it's looking at that deeper understanding that, um, that we want kids to walk away with, that conceptual understanding that we want students, when we see them 10 years from now, for them to remember in the grocery store. Looking at maybe those five big ideas that we want kids to walk away with, that we want our parents to reinforce at home. I was just in a classroom that the teacher had up, um, in what ways does location affect culture? And it was a sixth grade social studies class. In what ways does location affect culture? He continuously brought his class back to that bigger idea of location affecting culture. And naturally thinking about that deeper understanding. Underneath that are what are those learning targets? What are the four things in this unit that we're going to give our students feedback on? What's the scaffolding? What's that kind of that that day to day that we're going to we're going to share with our students? This is what we want you to learn. So really, that first key of alignment is knowing where you're headed with your students in terms of learning. The next key, the key of assess, is really thinking about, now that I know where I'm headed with my students, and I've got my roadmap for learning, now I need to find out where my students are during the learning. So the assess key, this is a, a, has so many different dimensions to it, the assess key is about putting assessment at a different point in instruction. 
So rather than find out at the end of instruction, at a summative assessment time, that I didn't understand it, that a child didn't understand it, it's putting assessment during the learning so that we can really hold that mirror up for students as they're, um, as they're progressing and while there's still time to do something about it. Um, I always think about uh, grading papers on Sundays. And you get to the end of a unit, and you find out that half of your kids understood it, and the other half of your students didn't understand it. And it's a terrible feeling. We're faced with a huge curriculum plate, need to move on. What we're talking about is finding out before that point, having those mirrors up, having ways, some formative, informal, formal ways of gathering evidence of students learning during the learning. The other component to the assess key is making sure that our assessments, whether they're formative paper pencil or they're summative, kind of that high stakes assessment, that those are valid and reliable, that they are an accurate um, representation, measuring exactly what we wanted to measure, measuring that alignment key, um, not, not measuring the parents, making sure that we're measuring exactly what we intended to. So that's kind of a hefty key. Um, so now that we know where we're headed with our students and we have found out during the learning where our students are, we've got some formative, um, formative data, we've, we've um, gathered that information, now we move on to the achieve key. And what the achieve key is using that information to guide our instruction, to have some different things happening in my classroom, to have a day where we pause and we may be doing some different things in my classroom. It may have started out together, but now that I've gathered that data, I've gathered that information, I can't move on. I find out that, um, that half of my kids get it and half of them don't, or, or you know, some different groups fall out. And that key is really about, um, it is about differentiate instruction, having some different groups going on, um, involving the students in that process. Um, this key, we talk a lot about the student involvement and, and really pulling children inside of the assessment system um, so that they're getting the right feedback, um, the, the right feedback that helps them to get better the next time. We always, what, what we want to think about is when we are creating papers on that Sunday is, is there a, a the next time the child went to write, the next time the child went to read, did they become better writers based on our Sunday, based on our feedback? And there's really two different types of feedback. There's evaluative feedback, which is really that A, B, C, D, or there's descriptive feedback. And what we know about descriptive feedback is that kids often get too much descriptive feedback. Um, and when they get too much descriptive feedback, they really it doesn't help them to get better. So what do they do well, and what's their next step uh, in learning? The last component to that achieve key is how do we communicate this out accurately? How do we report out to our families um, accurately and really represent, um, represent learning, represent responsibilities, um, and, and, and what does that look like in, in standards-based? So this is really sort of big picture, um, big picture standards-based instruction. And I can tell you through experience that um, this takes time. There are so many different components when we work with School districts, um, folks are really amazing at that alignment key. They've they've got that down, and they share that with the students. Um, but they may they're they're working on gathering evidence during the learning or using that that achieve key, um, or or they're assessing all the time, but they they have too many different assessments going on, and they're not really sure how that information um, is being used. Um, just a, a, a side note: I had a school district that asked me. Um, to come in and work on um, common assessments, program assessments, where every nine weeks we have uh, program assessments. And they asked me, it was changing from states, their state standards to common core standards. They said, you know, this is actually for kindergarten. And they said, could you just take a look at this common assessment, maybe shuffle some things around and make it common core? And I said, well, you know, let me see it. Let me take a look at it. And I know you'll gasp when I say this. It was 40 pages long. And I said, you know, I, I can't do that. I think what we have to think about is what, first of all, what are you measuring? And is there a way to measure this in a way that children, especially kindergartners, don't even need to know they're being assessed? Where we could have a, a calibrated rubric that when I see them with concepts of print, I can just highlight, yes, they're holding the book correctly. They're doing, you know, so that we don't have to have that paper pencil assessment. And it's really not necessarily an accurate way 
uh, to measure some of those things. So, uh, so lots of different ways to think about this. But um, the one thing I do want to say is, you know, when we work with districts, sometimes people spend a year on the Align Key, and then the next year they're really working on that Assess Key, and then the next year they might start to do some different grouping and different grading practices. So it's something that doesn't happen quickly, and we have to look at kind of what are our strengths and, and where are we, what's kind of our, our next step um, in terms of standards-based instruction. So big picture there. We are going to dig into um, the assess key, not from the formative assessment or that feedback loop, but what we'd like to, what I'd like to dig into is assessment design. Um, with a lot of states looking at student growth measures and um, for teacher evaluation, pre-K through 12, looking at how do we, what is our method for measuring student growth, well, what comes out of that, usually student learning objectives or different ways that we're writing a goal for our students and we're measuring that over time, different growth targets. And what we find is um, that sort of the greatest thing that's come out of that is, is teachers saying, you know what, I'm not sure if this assessment meet standards of quality. I'm not sure about that. And so it's been, I think it's such a, an advantage to go in and say, well, let's take a look at assessments. What are the qualities to a strong rubric or to a strong assessment? Because whether legislation comes or goes, student growth measures, what's in place is there, the skills in the classroom assessments, when, when we are using some of the paper pencil assessments, we can start to look at and say, okay, this is valid and reliable. So that's really what we're going to get into is that assessment design. How do we design um, a valid and reliable assessment? We have um, kind of put our assessment design into three um, buckets, if you will, sort of three buckets of, of a process for developing or evaluating um, an assessment that you're going to give, a, a paper pencil assessment, um, a summative assessment, or a common assessment. The very first thing that, you, that we have to do before creating um, that assessment is the plan phase. And within the plan phase, is thinking about how, thinking about um, our assessment in terms of um, what are we assessing? Running right back to that align key, what am I assessing? Um, to what level am I assessing that? What is the conceptual level and, you know, what is the cognitive level that I'm going to be assessing at? And then um, what is my instructional balance? How much, you know, when you look at the whole term, um, making a, a, a game plan for that assessment, this is the most crucial phase to a quality assessment. And I'm going to come back around to that um, towards, towards um, the end of this section. But that phase, if it's skipped over, which as a teacher, I started teaching uh, 23 years ago, and as a teacher, I, I did skip over this. I went right to development. I started to write my assessment out. I started to think about, OK, what I did in the last few days, and I just went right to the development phase. Or I went right to the evaluate phase. And in the evaluate phase, I'm pulling an assessment from an online um, item bank. I'm pulling assessment from my resource. But I didn't plan, and I didn't think about what have I been doing? What, what do I want to measure? To what level am I measuring that? And what is my instructional representation? How much, of, how much instructional time have I spent on some different things? And then really digging into that. So after the plan phase, you can go in either direction, either to the uh, evaluate phase. So if I am going to pull an assessment from, if I have my blueprint and I've planned out exactly what I'm looking for, I can head into um, that bank or head into some resources or some old assessments and pull questions and think about, OK, this is exactly what I'm looking for, and start to evaluate that effect, the effectiveness of that. Uh, or I can, I can hit the plan phase and move over into development and start to develop a short answer, extended response, and look through that. So definitely um, some, a process there, plan um, being really the most important in the first phase and the one that, unfortunately, we, we skip over a lot. What I'd like to do 
kind of the, the overarching, when we're thinking about assessment design, the two things that, that I want you to leave um, understanding is, is what makes a valid and reliable assessment. People talk about that all the time, and it's um, just two terms that I, I think are, are, are so important, um, validity being just an accurate representation of what you wanted to assess, and we'll dig a little deeper into that, and reliability being consistent. What I'd like for you to do is just look at this kind of fun um, dartboard there and just take a minute and see if you can figure out which is valid, which is reliable. We're going to come back to this at the end of kind of our assessment design and see if you can, um, if you can uh, capture this, but just to get you thinking about this. Just look at those um, A, B, C, D. See if you can figure out which, which is valid and reliable, which is not valid and reliable in those different scenarios. Just take a minute there. All right, we will come back to that, and um, I'm sure at the end of this time you'll be able to, um, to hit each one of those. They're kind of a fun way to think about it. Validity is being able to accurately make an inference about your students. This is kind of an interesting thing to think about. So when we give kids an assessment, the assessment, what we are doing is we are inferring about the learner. So validity is accurately kind of two different things. It's content validity, meaning am I making the right in inference about the right content? Am I measuring, is, is, my, is my assessment measuring the right content? And then the second part of this is the construct validity. And construct validity is really thinking about what uh, what construct am I measuring? Am I measuring problem solving, or am I measuring something that's more at that at that knowledge base? And some of this comes through the con actual construction of the assessment. But validity, the one thing that people sometimes forget about with validity, it's it's really about the teacher's interpretation. So after I give an assessment, am I making a valid interpretation that Katie really understands that content? Um, and, and that's where, where that validity is understanding that. I'll dig into a little bit deeper for that. Content validity is thinking about what are the standards that I'm measuring? What right back to that align, alignment key. And then that cognitive demand, to what level am I measuring that? Am I measuring it at a knowledge level or am I measuring it at a higher level? What am, to what level am I really trying to measure? And we know that different types of assessment line up with higher level, um, higher level thinking skills. Um, so, so we have to think about what is the cognitive demand to the content that I am measuring. And then that representational is, is looking back over your instructional representation and, and saying, uh, did I spend did I spend the last day on this content or did I spend the last semester on this content? For example, there are a semester exam that only includes content covered during the last six weeks um, is is not a valid measure of the course's overall. If the semester was um, you know, if the semester was 18 weeks, and when you really look at my semester exam, it was only the last three weeks of content, um, or, or we start to look at what are the standards we're measuring, to what level are we measuring, and did this really represent the instruction uh, that was delivered. Now, this, it, the, the one thing about validity, content validity, a blueprint, which we'll get into, that plan phase that I talked about in that first bucket, will help with content validity, will help with saying, did I measure the right content there? Construct validity is the extent that the test measures the constructing that it claimed to be measuring. So a construct is like a, your ability, your, your, um, a skill in, in your brain. Um, for example, solving problems would be, um, would be a construct. 
so making sure that what we intend to measure in terms of the contract, that's exactly what it's measuring. This has a little bit of overlap in terms of looking at the actual, uh, the actual questions, a little bit of, of over, overlap there. If an assessment measures the ability to solve math problems, then inferences about the students and their ability to solve those math, um, ma the math pro problems um, have a chance to be valid. So making sure that that lines up, so that construct validity. So if we have an assessment that's designed to measure the construct, like uh, math problem solving abilities, we want to ensure that all questions in that, in that assessment measure that construct. So what is the biggest threat to, to validity? The biggest threat to having a valid assessment is really that poor alignment. Measuring something that um, that's not the right standard, measuring something that, that might, maybe we're not measuring the standards, maybe we're measuring the resource, um, and, and then looking deeply at that cognitive demand, that level, um, and then that representational balance as well. This is taken care of with a blueprint, and we'll get into that a little bit. The other threat to validity is low quality test items, and this is digging deeper into assessment design, and this is really digging into um, making sure that our items, whether they are uh, selected response or they are short answer, that they meet those standards of quality. So that's a whole, that's digging deeper into that uh, assessment design. So just, uh, we won't do the turn and talk, but just thinking through the validity in your own mind, what makes a valid assessment. Just kind of take a minute to think about that. Reliability, validity and reliability. Reliability is really looking at the tool and looking at those consistent um, or repeatable results. Um, I like to think of reliability as um, the tool, meaning let's say a scale, and getting on a scale. And if we get on a scale, let's think of um, uh, Gwyneth uh, Paltrow. And Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, you know, I, I'm going to guess she probably weighs about 110 pounds. We'll just guess that. We'll play along um, with me on this one. And she hops on a scale, and she gets on that scale, and it is 200. 201, 199, 202, 200, every time she gets on that tool. That is a reliable scale. It's probably not valid. It's probably not measuring what it's intended to measure, but that tool is giving us consistent results. I, lo I like to think of validity and reliability with that scale analogy. So we hop on, hops on a scale, and she gets um, 110. She gets 201, 157, 140. Not reliable, um, kind of all, all over, all over the place. So it's thinking about the tool and if that tool is giving us those consistent results. The interesting thing about reliability, it's they're interrelated, um, how they're related to one another, because they absolutely are related to one another. Um, and, and the relationship, uh, their relationship is important. We can test a, a tool, a, an assessment for reliability, and it can be very reliable. But if we're measuring the wrong standards, we are making an inference about students' learning that's not valid. So we need to have consistent results, but it's, it's got to be valid. So it's an interesting kind of um, intertwine, if you will. If a test is not produced with those reliable, consistent results, it's difficult to infer that the results are valid in any way. So validity is dependent on, reli on that reliability. However, a test can be reliable on its own. It can measure those repeated results, and that reliability is independent of validity. And that's a lot to think about, but it's it's true. Um, so we can measure we we can measure, and um, 
and, and I'll get into some, some more examples for you, uh, but reliability by itself does not guarantee that valid inferences are made to make sure that it's, we're also measuring the right content. So when we think about reliability and testing and assessment for um, reliability, what we're thinking about, um, there's really four different things they talk about with reliability. Does this mean that our teachers need to do this um, You know, when they're creating their assessments? They, they do not need to do this, but um, some of them definitely it's integrated reliability. But it's, it's understanding kind of the tenets of, of a reliable assessment. So when we think about um, stability, stability is simply giving the same test twice. So, um, so if we gave a test once to a group of, of students and then wait th you know, three or four, five days, no instruction occurs in between, we give them a, the same test again and we look at those results. And if those results are within that standard deviation, they say kind of 70% and higher, then that's a reliable assessment. Alternative, um, alternate forms, when we give those parallel forms, so we have a um, form A and a form B, and we see if, um, if, if we get those reliable results with those different forms when we look at, um, when we look at students sort of in that same quintile. Um, internal consistency is when we compare, when we can pull apart different parts of our assessment to see if, um, if different parts of that, um, if, if we pulled out the first five questions and the last five questions or the, take it and do 50 and 50, and we see if the students are scoring the same, uh, the same uh, rate of reliability. Um, then we have a valid assessment. Um, and then the last one, the inner rater reliability. This is something I think that uh, is very doable, especially when we think about performance assessments and we think about our rubrics and um, creating a, a rubric and then having different folks score, different, um, different educators score work, same work um, or same performance with that rubric and really calibrating to see if this tool, if we get the same scores 70% of the time or higher. So it's really thinking about, um, thinking about calibrating to that rubric. Obviously, we have to have a great tool to make sure that with different scores, we get the same, uh, same results. So those are just some different ways to think about um, how, we, how we can have that reliability. Now, reliability hinges on three factors. Um, one that we, we have little, uh, little or uh, less control over, and, and the other two that we do have more control over. Um, student factors um, is, is really when we have students, um, you know, that didn't eat that morning or their parents got in a fight um, and, and we have a very reliable assessment. Um, however, when we gave it the first time, they were, um, they were fed and they were there and their parents didn't fight that morning and then we give them that same assessment and, um, and, and there, you know, there was things that were happening, the human factor that we can't control. Um, that's just something that, that we cannot control. However, we can control test factors and test questions and making sure that we don't have those um, ambiguous or tricky items or poor directions on an assessment. And this is really digging into that assessment design. Um, we actually have for every, um, for every type of assessment, we have a checklist um, for whether you're creating a performance assessment or, re, or you're creating a, um, a selected response of, of these questions of, of certain pitfalls and things we have to stay away from, um, I'm happy to, um, to email those or, or send those out um, in a link to folks to look at. Um, and then the last is the, is the scoring factor. Um, and that's having, that, that's having your um, the, your scoring guidelines completely in place and, and making sure that those are clear to the scorer, making sure that um, we don't have um, ambiguous um, directions for, for the score um, or errors that can take place. So those are some of those, um, 
some of those factors with reliability. Um, remember that reliability is the pre precursor to that test literature, being able to make a valid inference about the learners. Um, if the test scores cannot be assigned consistently, if they're all over the mark, it's difficult to determine that that score accurately measures what it is supposed to. Um, I had a, a rubric that was sent to me um, from a district that was um, did not meet standards of quality, and they asked me about it. And I had two different um, scores grade the same uh, same same samples from students, and they had such a difficult time they couldn't score it. And the scores between the students were so far off um, because. The task wasn't clear in terms of the performance assessment, but certainly the rubric wasn't clear in terms of um, uh, in terms of getting that uh, that feedback or getting that score on there. So the teacher never made an accurate uh, or a valid inference about the learning of the students. So it, it's so um, they're so intertwined. So I'm going to go back just with the validity and reliability. I'm going to go back to this. Um, uh, this chart here, and just want you to take a minute to see if with that um, A, B, C, D, if you could pick out which ones, kind of the way they go is there's one that is absolutely valid and reliable. There was one that's not valid, but it's reliable. So if you, if you catch um, where we're going, see if you can figure this out now, which, which are, is which. All right, this is a fun thing. If you have um, colleagues or staff to do with your staff, I'm happy also to email this to you as well. Um, A, as you can imagine, is not valid and not reliable and really our worst case scenario. That we're measuring all different things. We're measuring um, you know, maybe things that happened within the last week. Um, we may be measuring the resource or stories we told. It, we're not measuring what we intended to measure. Um, and it's, it's not valid. Our results are sort of all over the place. So not valid, not reliable. That B is um, repeatable. We're getting repeatable results. So it, it is, it is um, reliable but it's not valid. It's not even on the chart. So this is when we get those consistent results. This is um, that example of getting on the scale, um, Gwyneth Paltrow getting on the scale and getting her 200, 201, 199, and definitely not in, in the right ballpark there. I'm going to talk about C uh, last. D is kind of that, that perfect world, that um, valid and reliable, right on the money, accurate um, and repeatable results. However, we probably are not, we, we, we're dealing with some human factors here with the reliability. We're probably going to see C more often because of some of the student errors, where um, this really is in that range um, of we're, we're hitting the mark, we're more, we're definitely valid here. Technically, you could say this is not reliable because they're not all clumped together. But in terms of standard error, this is within the reasonable standard error. So we're going to see C more often, um, more often than, uh, than probably we're going to see D just because of that human factor. But just a fun way to kind of think about validity and creating a valid and reliable assessment. Does all this talk about a valid and reliable assessment need to be you think we need to conduct statistical analysis on all of our assessments? Certainly not. But if we're aware of the tenets of you know, what makes a, a quality assessment, know what are we measuring, to what level are we measuring, what's that instructional representation, um, that's just really important for us. And if we have that rubric, that example that I gave you of, of that kindergarten where we could use a rubric, kids don't need to know they're being assessed, we're using a rubric, why don't we have some different folks use that rubric to see if it has that inner rate of reliability. So we've created a rubric that really, that, that we believe is valid. It's hitting um, the content that, that we wanted it to. So we can make those inferences, those valid inference, but now let's calibrate it to make sure that it's reliable. So we can do some of those things if we really understand kind of the bigger picture. 
um, last one on, on validity and reliability is um, validity really means uh, that accuracy, measuring the content, construct, reliability is that consistent, repeatable results. Test factors are part of that and scoring factors are part of that that we really can control. Now in terms of those three buckets, and I'm, I'm going to leave you with uh, the blueprint and um, just talking a little bit about the blueprint because this is sort of my um, soapbox a little bit. I just think it's so important for assessment design. Remember we talked about that plan bucket and within that plan bucket in order to really have that valid assessment, it's thinking about the alignment piece, thinking about the, the um, content thinking about the content validity, standards, which underneath that is standards, cognitive demand, and then assessment types. What type of assessment am I going to use? So just to show you that, and, and what we think about, and I think of this with um, summative assessments, whether they're unit assessments or they're end of course assessments, um, with, with pretty much all assessments that we give students, we've got to start with that, paper, with that blueprint to say, what is it that I'm measuring? Um, and and we, oh, I use the analogy of an architect is not just start building a house. So when we go to an item bank and we start pulling from an item bank, um, it may be late in the day and I've got to get a, a test and kids put their heart into those summative assessments. It's late in the day and I go and I grab a bunch of item banks uh, and I pull and I create a, an assessment. And I haven't slowed down to think, what, what is this? What am I measuring? And if we can stop and do that and create a blueprint and think about what is it, what's the content I'm measuring, to what level, what's that instructional, and then how am I measuring it, we're going to have higher quality assessments. Um, an example of creating an assessment blueprint, it's really um, determining that what's important and enduring, what is the bigger idea there, identifying that cognitive demand to what level, and then figuring out the best method for assessment, um, matching that best method for assessment, and then emphasizing the same content that we taught during instruction. So an example of this, and I'll show you exactly where to find this. I've got an interactive one um, that I'll, I'll be able to share with you. An um, example of an assessment blueprint is just starting with those learning expectations. We have many different um, different uh, types of assessment blueprints. Sometimes we call these learning targets. Sometimes we um, learning expectation. Um, lots of different ways depending on what what the school district is used to. But this is really what are you measuring? What's the learning target here? The next column over types of learning expectations. So to what level um, are we at the knowledge? Are we at the skill? Reason? Where are we in terms of blooms? To what level? What's the cognitive demand of that learning expectation? Then what type of assessment am I going to use? Is it going to be a written response, performance assessment? I'm going to use some selected response. And then what's my representational alignment? How much time did I spend on this with students? Then what's my number of questions? On our website, um, qualityinstruction.org, or just you can Google Align, Assess, Achieve, under our assessment um, design training, we have an interactive blueprint. Download that. Use it. It makes such a difference. Um, just stopping and thinking about you know, building that quality assessment design, really the first step in assessment design. There's, there's so much more to it, but, but really, um, really the first step there. So we're back to these three keys. I hope that was a, a um, overview. We didn't. We certainly didn't dig deep into um, creating performance assessments or creating, uh, you know, the different. Um, different selected response and all those good things, but hopefully you got a good idea of sort of the, the bigger picture of assessment design. Um, what I'd like to get into is one of my favorite topics um, that I'm pretty passionate about, and that is how we communicate um, learning and um, how do we accurately communicate that. Um, and, and the reason that I'm, I'm passionate about this um, is I just think that when people get into, when, when I see educators get into um, 
aligning, knowing where they're headed with their students and, and measuring along the way. And, and they start to change things, and, and they're, they're thinking about you know, leading with learning and not with tasks and activities, then they start to scratch their head and say, why do we report out the way we report out? This doesn't make sense. Um, and, and that's true. So in a unit of study, if a student gets um, you know, a 20% um, on, uh, on their first quiz, and then they get a 50% uh, a, a on their second quiz. And, and the teacher's changing gears with the student. By the time they get to their summative assessment, they get an 85%. How do we report that out? In, in a more traditional setting, sometimes we average that together. When we average that together, that's actu actually not accurate. It's not an accurate representation. That, that, that child got to that 85%. They understand. They could show you in different ways. Thinking about what, what I like to do um, is think about, is push people's thinking around how we grade and why we grade, um, because it, it's, it's so important. What, what I always think about is um, grading is the most concrete example out there in the community of the district's educational philosophy. And it's so, um, it's, how, it's how our community views us. So, it's seen by parents and students as really a, such a consideration when designing our lessons. And frankly, it, it, it really is. It's how when, when we are, um, when we're really compliance grading and we have a lot of um, activities that we're asking our, our students to do, um, then, then it really, it, it sometimes can mask learning and accurately sort of reporting that out. Um, as Bob Marzano says, uh, practices sometimes they're so imprecise, they're almost meaningless. There's so many different grading practices within an ABCD system, within a standards-based system. What I always like to say is we've got to ask questions. We can't rush into a standards-based grading system without saying, does that make sense? I've seen the continuum. I've worked with school districts on the continuum of we've gone from ABCD or a percentage to all the way over here where we, I was in a school district that um, I was doing a formative assessment training, and the school district said, you know what, um, we grade out on, uh, this was during the time of what's called uh, grade level indicators, very um, knowledge level uh, indicators, standards, but, but knowledge level, and every grade level had lots and lots of them, like 82 in eighth grade math in the state of Ohio, grade level indicators. And they had to do a rubric, 4321, for every single grade grade level indicator. And this was in K through um, grade six or seven. And what, what that changed in the classroom was that change, everything became about measuring discrete little skills. And they were, you know, standards based, but that didn't make any sense. So there's a continuum of does this sense? So we have to really ask that. And, and as a district asking, who do we share our grades with? Who, who are we communicating to? And, and really, can we, can we communicate so that, um, so that our, the, the folks that are, um, that are receiving this communication can understand it, that it, that it can really be something that's understandable? What do our grades consist of? What are they made of? Um, and then in what ways do we share our grades with the public? Um, and, and how do we do that? So as a school district asking some of these questions, um, a lot of this comes from the Assessment Training Institute, um, great, uh, great fan of Rick Stiggins and Ken O'Connor. Um, there's so many researchers that I just, um, you know, that I am such a fan of over the years. As an individual teacher, whether you are depending on kind of what system that you live in for reporting out, asking, what are my actual grading practices? Am I averaging? Um, or in, in what, how am I landing on that? Am I able to, um, is this the best way to be doing this? Um, what was the main influence on my grading practices? Oftentimes we don't know where this came from. Um, how do our practices compare with other teachers in our school? How do we land on our grade? How do others land on it? How do we do this? And, and just asking to make sure, does this make sense? Um, 
I'm going to give you a personal example um, of one of uh, one of my children who um, had had in the past um, all A's every single term. He's such a compliant, hardworking student. I knew he was struggling, um, but in in all his classes, A's, and he did everything. Worked so hard. At the end of the school year, I got a letter that he needed to be in uh, in reading intervention and math intervention. What's the disconnect there? What's the disconnect between that compliance and reporting out that behavior versus we're going to need to do something? Sometimes when we peel that onion back and we start to look, what exactly is it? Where is he um, in terms of learning? Then we can change gears. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing when that, I'm sure we all have uh, experiences like that. The Assessment Training Institute, Rick Stiggins uh, Institute, where I was trained in 2000, which was a long time ago, um, the purpose of grades, what I want everyone to think about, grade, the grade, grade is to communicate. We communicate. It is not to motivate. It is simply a communication tool, and it is a communication tool to, for only that child. And grades communicate only achievement. I love to see people communicate responsibilities separately. Um, responsibilities separately so that I've seen it done where at the beginning of the year the teacher says, what does it take to be hired as a student? And then what does it take to be fired as a student? And then together they come up with a rubric of qualities of an effective student. And so together they report that out every nine weeks. So it's very clear. When we mush it all together, when it's all in the grade, it doesn't give us a clear picture. It doesn't communicate to the parents, this is where they are in terms of learning. This is what we need to look at in terms of responsibilities. Grades only communicate achievement, and grades communicate achievement at a, at a point in time. So we want to take the most recent evidence. I always say to students, um, I, I'm gathering evidence of your learning, and I have insufficient evidence of your learning. And they look at you and think, what do you mean you have insufficient evidence? You haven't given me any evidence, so I don't know where you are, so it's hard to change gears. So it's really about gathering evidence. When we think about how confident are you that, your gra that grades in your school are accurate, consistent, meaningful, and supportive of learning. So thinking about that as sort of your your goal when you're when you're examining are you know are we really accurately reporting out or are we masking kids' grades? Um, you know it, it becomes frustrating to students as as they're at that twenty percent that fifty percent and then they get to that eighty five percent. It's not really you know as we average that together, it's it just isn't an accurate reflection of where they are. So thinking is this consistent? Is it meaningful? Um, and, and if they, it, it, if any of those um, are not met, then our grades are really um, ineffective. Ken O'Connor, uh, big fan of Ken O'Connor, um, 15 fixes for broken grades. He basically chunks all those 15 fixes, I sort of boiled it down for you, into fixes for practices that kind of distort achievement. And, and some of those, um, some of those fixes that distort achievement are including student behavior, um, things that you know, there is things that um, work submitted late. There's other ways to correct the behavior than reporting that out. So he kind of lumps together a whole bunch of fixes that really distort achievement, um, giving extra credit uh, for. You know, they could not have learned it, but done all that extra credit really distorts and maybe masks their achievements. So when they get to that high stakes test or they move on to college, they have that difficulty. So there's some fixes to make sure that we don't distort that achievement. The other fix is for low quality or, or um, poor, poor quality um, organization of, of our evidence. Really what I, I talk to teachers about is and sometimes this makes, um, makes their head spin if it's kind of the first time they've thought about this, at the top of their grade book, instead of putting tasks and activities, so we're really leading with um, compliance and if you do this, then you'll get that, moving to putting up at the top of my grade book what I want them to learn. Not every little discrete skill, but what is it, what is it that I want them to learn changed everything in my classroom. 
So thinking about that, am I, am I gathering evidence around their learning? And some of those fixes can help that organization of, of the evidence. Fixes for inappropriate grade calculations. So this is just an example. Um, if I took the temperature of, um, of uh, Columbus, Ohio every single day over the past um, week, 80, 89 degrees, 88, 93, 97, I forgot to take it one day, so there's that zero. 91, 95, well, I know I forgot to take it, but I'm, I got to include that zero in there. We average that together, it's a 79%. Is that really the average, does that really represent um, the average uh, temperature? Probably not. So, so just some, some thinking around that, those inappropriate grade calculations um, and, and averaging and, and really thinking, why do we do that? Um, fixes to support learning. This is putting in place those formative, those formative feedbacks along, way, along the way um, and, and thinking about that. Rick uh, Warmelly, absolute um, big fan. Um, I, I just um, admire his work so much. Um, stop averaging um, the grade is what he always says and hiding behind the math. Just really thinking about, you know, we've got to take that step even if we may not be in a standard space, but, but can we start to look at, uh, look at things a little bit different in our grade book? The only reason the electronic grade books, there's so much research out there about electronic grade books and really um, what that's done and that's actually made things a little bit worse, but some of the grade books that are really supportive of that, of um, feedback and standards um, absolutely have not, but sometimes when they're, when they're just about tasks and activities, um, then, we, then we're really pushing to that compliance grade, um, grade a lot. We always think about um, Tom Gusky is reporting out three buckets. We want to report out mastery of learning, where they are in terms of learning. We want to report out separately their responsibilities, and we want to report out um, growth as well. So I often see number one and number two done. Sometimes I, I, I don't see that growth, but it's where did they come in and where are they? So that when we think about a communication tool, can we create a communication tool that reflects that, that shows that mastery of learning, shows those responsibilities, and then that growth. And so I just push you to kind of think about what are we communicating um, with, with our grade, grade book. Some considerations, determining the philosophy on grading, the purpose of grades, what are we doing, and does this make sense for our students? And the form should come after that. The communication tool shouldn't be the lead out of the gate. Oftentimes, the lead out of the gate is the communication tool, the online grade book. But the district hasn't thought about what is our philosophy? What do we report at? What do we believe in? Um, does this make sense? Or, or does it, you know, does it not make sense? If we had that discussion, can we really be supportive of learning? And then determine the audience. Who will be reported? Is it understandable for the people to read that communication tool? And really, are the accurate descriptors of learning? So those are some considerations when we think about that. My hope for you when thinking about um, just examining grading practices is take time to review grading practices within the district. Think through all the facet, facets of standards-based grading um, so that we, you don't go way over to that example I gave, I gave before. So thinking through all of the components, starting a conversation about why do we do what we do? Is it steeped in tradition or is it accurate reflection of learning? Um, and within the classroom is my great, accurate, consistent, meaningful. One great resource is Gusky's book called Practical Solutions for Serious Problems in Standards-Based Grading. He hits everyone when people say, well, we can't do that because of colleges. He hits that. He tucks all different components to standards-based grade. Absolutely fabulous book. Learn from the best and surround yourself with lots of information before making that change or before or, or not making that change. Um, Gusky and uh, Wormelli and O'Connor and Brookhart Marzano, just to name a few. Um, we're back to those three keys. Um, and I do want to say one of our, um, and I'm watching the clock closely, one of our um, tools when we talk about that alignment key, um, knowing where you're headed, those deeper understandings, those essential questions. One of our tools that um, McGraw-Hill, uh, that McGraw-Hill distributes for us, the link is right there, is um, Flipbooks and those flipbooks are enduring understandings, essential questions, learning targets for 
um, K through 12, 24 books, English language arts, math, and the literacy and science and social studies. And what a great um, thing that that does is that starts with that alignment piece. So as we look at assessment design, we can pull right from there. What are we measuring? So that lines up quite nicely. Um, hopefully, we gave you an overview of the bigger picture of standards-based instruction. Dug a little bit deeper into assessment design. Started to go into my uh, my passion for sound grading and how we kind of communicate learning, just to start that conversation about why do we do what we do. Um, and I uh, hope I gave you some some good information. I in our short time we have left, I'm happy to um, look at any questions that have come in. I'm honored to be here. Um, and, and please check us out. We're uh, qualityinstruction.org, or you could just Google Align Assess Achieve. Um, I'm happy to work with your district or um, anything else we can do to help. Do we have any questions? I know I kind of cut it right up to the edge there. Oh, well, thank you, Katie. Um, a couple of questions have come in about the presentation. And I just wanted to reassure everybody that right after the webinar, we'll be emailing you a link to the recording. And we can also work on providing the slides to you as well. Um, so people obviously uh, would like a copy of the presentation, Katie. And the other question that came in is, will there be any certificate of completion or record of attendance? Unfortunately, we are not providing that for this, this webinar. Um, we you could know, actually do that through our office. That's what I was going to ask you, Katie, if that's something no that No problem. We do that all the time. Awesome. So what you would have to email um, josh at qualityinstruction.org, and he can get that out to you. Absolutely. Okay. Any other I questions? Okay, I'm just looking. Question um, if from Brad is if we are right at the beginning of the SVG journey, where is the best place to start with the staff? Just at the beginning of the journey. So, oh, I'd have so many questions as to where you are, what you do now. Um, uh, best place to start is just to start um, gathering information, deciding, kind of answering some of those questions. What what you believe in, um, you know. I'd be happy to talk offline um, about about that as well. Um, but anything to just start start looking at um, what what first the first step is is deciding what you believe in in terms of um, reporting out on those three buckets. Um, that that's really sort of a, a non-negotiable. Sometimes I, I see where people don't report out on the progress, and that's okay. How do we report out in terms of learning? How do we report out responsibilities? What does that look like? Um, what do, what do we currently do? What do we believe in? What are the barriers? Um, that big conversation first, and then um, and then digging into identifying form, identifying getting you know examples and and. So that's, that's a whole step later on um, involving the parents in that process. Um, uh, just, you know, I, I would definitely um, start there, I guess. But I'm happy to help as well. My email is um, katie at qualityinstruction.org. It takes me a little bit of time to get back to people. I'm on the road a lot. So. But I'm happy to, happy to help in any way. Thanks, Katie. And there was another request, um, and this time it's for the copy of the form um, for evaluating the re reliability of the different types of assessments. Um, yes, for sure. If you email, uh, it depends on which one, and we're going to start to put those on our website. Um, if you email us which one you are looking for, so we have um, one for, uh, for the evaluation side of um, performance assessments, selected response, for every type of assessment for written response. We have them for both sides, whether you are um, evaluating an assessment or you're developing one. So we have two, we have a checklist when you're developing it and kind of a rubric for when you're evaluating it. So, um, so we have those as well. And, and um, Josh can get those to you, um, no problem.
Fantastic. Well, that's it for the questions. I want to thank everybody for attending the webinar today. As I already said, we'll be sending the follow-up email to you with a link to the recording. And as you exit the webinar today, a survey will open, and we would really appreciate your feedback on helping us improve the webinars, um, especially going forward. And if we didn't get your, to your question today, you know, feel free to email Katie directly, or you can email us. Uh, webinars at mheeducation.com, and we'll be sure to forward any questions or feedback that we get to Katie as well. Um, but thank you again, and um, have a great evening. And thank you so much, Katie. It was great. Thanks. Oh, good. Thank you. Good night, everyone.